Good morning, North Highland Church. That video was shorter than I thought it was going to be. I was just moseying out, taking my time. Turn to somebody and say, you look marvelous today. We are beginning a brand new series this morning called Going Viral. And today we're going to talk about the need to succeed. So I want to invite you to take your copy of God's Word or your smart device and open to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Now, if you know anything about the social media world, you understand the phrase going viral. I'm curious, how many of you have a Facebook account? How about Twitter? Instagram? Snapchat? YouTube? LinkedIn? You take notes on Sunday, Pastor Lacey's sermon notes. Come on. Yeah, all right. There you go. Well, I know that there may be some listening and some online even that may not be that familiar with that term. You may not be that technologically savvy. and You may have said, oh, I've heard about it, viral, but I, I'm not sure exactly what it means. Well, don't feel badly. There's probably no one more technologically challenged than I am. Uh, although I was one of my first, uh, among my friends, I was one of the first to get a cell phone years ago in the early 80s. And it really wasn't like a cell phone today. It was a big bag about the size of this speaker. It, was, it literally was bigger than the briefcase I would carry around and I would carry around. And then those days, uh, I got a computer early on and I didn't know how to use it, but I got it. And we had to dial up in those days. Remember that? You dial up. You, that means you have to, for the young people, you, you have to dial up to get the Internet on, on your house phone. And, and a house phone was a phone that was on the wall in your house. Remember that? Remember when you had phones on the wall and TVs weren't? I mean, boy, things really change, but... Uh, so look in your outline there. You've got some sermon notes, and I wanted to give you a very simple definition since we're going to be talking about going viral the next four weeks. I want to give you a real simple definition. Here's what it means. Number one, by way of introduction. Today, the phrase refers to a video, an image, or an article on the internet shared by a large number of people in a very short period of time. Okay, it's something that's put on the internet. It reaches a large number of people, is shared by a large number in a very short period of time. Now, sometimes people refer to something going viral that has a few thousand shares. Other times it's in the millions, and just about anything can go viral. A blog can go viral, a photo, a tweet. Uh, a video, uh, even a coupon. I've never had a sermon that went viral. <laughs> I had some that went south. Um, but I thought, my, my staff thought it would be good to give you an example of a church video that went viral. Now, it's unbelievable that in the short period of time, this church video of a pastor baptizing someone literally got over 10 million views. 10 million. I did. But you'll see why. Check it out. This is Pastor Greg baptizing. No, no, don't do this. Enough is enough. Well, now, you know, I've gotten passionate in baptism service, but never quite that passionate. Now, in fairness to Pastor Greg, he got so many complaints, and he had a lot of people that liked it, too, that he, he gave a little response video that when he baptizes, he literally asks the people, now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you want to be baptized? And those three you saw, the first two said 10. The third one had been radically saved out of 
unbelievable lifestyle, you know, big, burly football player. He said, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you want to be baptized? And the guy said, I want a, I want a 25. So he jumped into baptistry with him. Now, we're going to baptize. The reason I'm sporting this baptism shirt is in the next service at the end, we're going to baptize some folks. But I can pretty well guarantee I'm not going to jump in the tank on top of someone. Yeah. You know, when something goes viral, it's really kind of a neat thing. People would love for their stuff to go viral because, first of all, it gives you immediate, incredible exposure. The second thing is it's free. It's like free advertising. No wonder a business wants something to go viral because that means a lot more sales. Or a leader, a pastor, a politician. They love it when their stuff goes viral because they get a lot more followers. Now, I'm curious. How many of you have a Bible app on your phone or iPad? You got a Bible app. Yeah, that, that's most of us. I, I use mine every day. I love it. My Bible app. Uh, and, and we also have our sermon outline on version. It's a free version of the Bible app. It's, it's uh, really a good version. I use it every day. In fact, when I'm driving, I'll pull up a passage. This week, I pulled up Joshua, and every time I got in the car, I hit it, and this guy with this charming British accent read to me. So it, it's really pretty cool. 50 million people have that app. Well, at the end of the year, they calculate how many times uh, script, certain scriptures have been shared or bookmarked or highlighted, and they literally rank the most popular Bible verses. Now, my staff thought it would be interesting, and I agreed that we take the top four Bible verses for last year, 2018, you know, the most popular verses, tweeted, shared, bookmarked, Facebook highlighted, whatever, and that we preach on those four. And, and so it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do a countdown. We're going to start today with the fourth most popular, next week the third and the second, and so forth. The scripture today is actually one of my favorites. I love this portion of scripture. It's from Joshua chapter 1, and it's actually the culmination of a great speech that God gives to Joshua. It's kind of God giving Joshua a pep talk, trying to pump him up, trying to fortify his faith. And you'll see in a few moments when we read our text why he needed that. He was afraid. He was worried. He was overwhelmed at the task. And there are two words, when we read our text, there are two words I want you to notice because they're going to jump out at you. Uh, they're pretty prominent. They stand out. The first word is the word success. And the second word is the word prosper. That God is very, very clear. He wants us to be successful and he wants us to prosper. God says, I want to encourage you, Joshua, before you take one step leading the people into the promised land, I want to make you a promise. I promise you, I will give you unqualified success. So be courageous. Now, if you want to know the secret of success, can I suggest you just spend some time here in Joshua chapter 1. Because the creator of the universe tells us how to be successful. And here's the really good news. God wants every single person in this room, every person live streaming, every person watching this message in our archives. He wants every single person to succeed. But here's a caveat. You got to write this down. Number two, God wants everybody to, to be successful his way, his way. Not my way, not your way, but his way. God says, I'm going to give you some principles, and they're not just principles for you, Joshua. These are going to be principles for the children of Israel, and they're going to be principles for centuries to come. Yeah, don't go, this is an ancient story. This is about Joshua. That was then. This is now. No, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, what happened to Joshua and the children of Israel are examples for us today. So the book of Joshua is like one gigantic object lesson. The truth there is a truth for every saint, every season, every situation. And when we read this verse, you, you may see why it went viral. It's actually the, 
the conclusion of this great speech on success. Now I want to invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word, would you? Let's commence our reading in verse 1. Verse 9 is actually the verse that went viral, the fourth most popular verse. But I want to get a running start on it so you get the, the back story. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun. Boy, isn't that an interesting name? And for those listening and not watching the text, that's not N-O-N-E, Nun, son of Nun. He's not a test tube baby, okay? It's N-U-N. What an interesting name. Son of Nun, Moses' aid. Moses, my servant, is dead, God says. Now then, you and all these people, get ready. Get ready, get ready. Get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from, from the great river Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So be strong. And courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give to them. Be strong and be very courageous. Be careful to obey all, everybody say all, all. obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Say the word meditate. meditate. You know, we've had that word hijacked. Biblical meditation is a very good thing. Meditate on the word of God day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Okay, drum roll. Here we are. Here's the viral verse. Verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That you may be successful wherever you go. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. It is no wonder a verse like that would go viral. What an incredible promise. That, that has to be one of the greatest promises that we read in your word. And that promise is for us. We're going to put our foot of faith on that promise and stand on it today. And believe you for great and mighty things. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. You may be seated. You know, I think most of us have the need to succeed. We don't want to be failures. We don't want to be flops. We want to succeed. We want to succeed in our careers. We want to succeed in our education. We want to succeed in our family life, in our finances. So we, we have a great pattern here for success. I mean, you don't get this in Harvard Business School. You can't go down to Barnes and Nobles and pick out some Tony Robbins books, those those may be wonderful, but you're not going to get the same thing. You can't pick up a New York Times bestseller and get this. These are not my principles. They're not Wall Street's principles. These are God's principles. And God really defines what success is. So let me tell you, here's what's, here's, in my opinion, reading this passage of Scripture, here's what God says success is. And I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to ask you to write them down. Number one, success is experiencing the presence of God experiencing the presence of God when we go back to our story we understand why Joshua was overwhelmed we understand why he was a little bit afraid to take the leadership role because he's following Moses uh, verse 1 said after the death of Moses the servant of the Lord and he says 
Well, that servant is dead. Now, you take all of these people. Well, that's kind of scary. I mean, that's, yeah. Why did God tell him, uh, you know, Moses is dead? Well, everybody knew that. Yeah, we know that. That's the problem. Moses is dead. Why did God want to remind Joshua of an obvious fact? Moses is dead. Well, he's trying to get him to realize something. I mean, you remember we talked about Moses, was it two weeks ago? Bigger than life, a legendary figure. See, Joshua wasn't just following a leader. He was following a legend. In fact, jot this down, letter A. Joshua was succeeding a legendary hero. Moses was the top guy in the, in, in the Jewish Hall of Fame. He was one of the mo most revered figures in Judaism. I mean, for 40 years, he had been their security blanket. He, he led them through the wilderness, and God performed many miracles through him. I mean, Moses was the guy that saw the burning bush and got commissioned by God to go to Pharaoh. And he's the guy that went to Pharaoh and said, God says, let his people go or else. He's the guy that when Pharaoh refused, took his rod and threw down and created these plagues that finally convinced Pharaoh to let the people go. Uh, he's the guy that laid the staff down and parted the waters of the Red Sea. He's the guy that came down from the mountain with the law of God in his hand. He is like the man. I got to follow the man, he said. And it's interesting. Moses had a relationship with God few people had. Exodus 33, 11 says about Moses something that it's not said about anybody else. Here's what Exodus 33, 11 says. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Yeah, Moses and God were not just best buds, you know, hey, we're like that. It was more like this. He was at the epicenter of God's heart. There was nobody quite like Moses, but Moses is gone. But God was saying, Joshua, Moses is gone, but hello, I'm still here, and I'm present. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. So, success is experiencing the presence of God. But number two, success is obeying the principles of God. It's obeying the principles of God. These are God's principles. Again, this is not what you get taught in a secular university. You can go to a secular university, learn the disciplines. You can study history, study psychology, learn success in business, in marketing, in management. But God says this, I got a different way of success because for you, success is going to be directly tied to how you relate to my book, the Bible, how you relate to my law, the law of God, how you and I relate to the law of God is going to determine how successful we are. Did you catch it in verse 7? Be strong, be courageous, uh, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or the left so that you may be, here's this word again, successful wherever you go. God says, you want to be successful? If you want to be successful, if you have the need to succeed, it pays to obey. Now I want you to say something to your neighbor right now. I want you to say, if you have the need to succeed, it pays to obey. You know what it is? He's, God says, okay, we're, we're going to make this easy. Just do what I said. Just do what the Word said. And he reinforces it in verse 8. Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. God's always pointing people back to his word. You want to be successful? Get in the book. Now, I almost did this. I, I didn't, but I almost took your sermon notes and just had a blank piece of paper there and played this little game with you called uh, word association. 
where I give you a word, you write down the very first thing that pops into your mind. And what I, what I thought about doing was having you get the piece of paper and say, okay, now what is the first word that comes to your mind when I say the word success? And I had a feeling some people would put popularity, possessions, positions, m maybe prestige, could be all kind of things. I mean, that's what the world says, success. And then God comes along and says, nay, nay, that is not success. You see, in God's eyes, you can do all those things. You can have power and possessions and popularity. And in God's eyes, be a colossal failure. See, it doesn't matter what the label is on your clothes. Your clothes may not be designer. It doesn't matter what brand of car you drive. It doesn't matter what your title is at work or the house or the apartment you live in. None of that matters to God. God says success for you is really, really simple. Here it is. Do what's right. Do what's right. Do what I tell you is right in my law. Now, I think the, <laughs> I think the light by this time, the light is coming on in Joshua's mind. Click. I mean, he said it again and again. Obey the law. Obey the law. Don't turn from the law. Then you will be successful. Then you will be prosperous. Moses is gone. And finally, he's like, okay, God, I got it. Moses is gone, but I've got the same presence of God guarding me that Moses had. I I've got the same principles guiding me that Moses had. Now, God wants to so make sure that Joshua gets this, that he really breaks it down. Okay, you're going to be hot after the Word of God. You're going to be hitting on all cylinders. Your heart's going to be full of the Word of God. That he really breaks it down. And let's look at verse 8 and, and jot these three things down as it comes to the Word of God. First, he says, look it up. Look it up. He says, don't let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Now, that kind of that threw me. I thought he was going to say, don't let, it, don't let the Word of God depart from your mind. Don't let the Word of God depart from your heart. But he didn't say that. He said, mouth. See, he's saying, Joshua, you, you got to read this book and not just read it. you got to digest it. You have to ingest it. You have to have so much of the Word inside of you that it's on the tip of your tongue. It's on the edge of your mouth, ready to come out. If your heart is full of the truth of God, your mouth will speak the truth of God. Now, let me make it real practical. If you're married, you can identify with this. How many of you have ever, how many of you who are married ever just popped off to your spouse and said something? Yeah, okay. How many of you did it on the way to church this morning? No, don't raise your hand. Yeah, there. Yeah, when you popped off, I, I remember saying one time to Sue, I said something, and it wasn't the nicest thing. I'm not proud of it. And she, and I, and she said, you're going to be sorry you said that. And I said, I already am. <laughs> so I follow up immediately with, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. Have you ever done? How many of you popped off and you saw that your spouse got mad and you go, hey, I didn't mean it. I take it back. I'm so How'd that work out for you? Not too good, does it? Because your spouse is going to say, you know what? If you did not mean it, you probably would not have said it. But because you're angry, you said what was actually in your heart. Yeah, and the question is, why did I say it in the first place? Because it was in my heart. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth speaks. I agree with the old farmers that used to say, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. That's why you've got to get the Word of God in your heart. The more Word of God you get in your heart, the more likely you are to say good things. The less Word of God you have in your heart, the more likely you are to say things that aren't going to be good and aren't going to be edifying. You're going to be apologizing a lot. So, look it up. Number two, let it in. Look it up, let it in. Verse 8, he says, 
meditate on it day and night. Meditate. So how do you medicate, uh, meditate? Don't medicate. Don't medicate. <laughs> meditate. I'll say it right. Yeah. Meditate as you meditate. Um, you know, when you think of med- you know, when I think of meditation, I think of some goofy looking dude sitting with his legs crossed, you know, pretzel style and, you know, hum, you know, looking down, contemplating the lint in his navel. Hmm, I'm meditating. No, that's not Bible meditation. In fact, for, for centuries, all the way back in the 16th century, Christians have been taking that word meditation and comparing it to a cow chewing its cud. Now, I would understand a lot of our students here, a lot of the millennials have, don't really know what a cow chewing its cud. How many of you know what it means? for a cow to chew the cud. How many of you know? Okay, see, some of us, some of us do. <laughs> I'm from the heartland. I g- grew up in farm-type situations, so that, that, we, that was just a common thing. Let me explain it to you. A chow, uh, a chow, <laughs> a cow chewing its cud, literally, I mean, th- these cows eat all the time. They'll eat for hours, and they eat this grass, this alfalfa, and they take it, and they swallow it, And it goes down to a small compartment, part of their stomach. They really have like three or four different stomachs, but one big, different compartments. And and they store it in this compartment. They don't ingest it or digest it. They store it. Then they'll go, and you'll notice, they'll go, and a lot of times they'll just go sit under a tree in the shade, and they're just chewing and chewing for hours. They'll just chew and chew, and they're not eating any grass. You know what they're doing? They're thinking, oh, I remember that alfalfa I had out there. Ooh, that hay. Oh, that was delicious. And they will call that forth. And I'm trying to think of a good word. Regurgitate. (laughs) That's a good word. They will regurgitate and bring that grass up in their mouth, and they will just chew on it. And they will chomp on it. They'll chew and chew and chew and so, so as to get all the vitamins and all the minerals and all the nutrients so that you have very healthy milk to drink in the morning. That's chewing their cud. Now, when the Bible says meditate, it's something similar in that you're not using your stomach, you're using your spirit. When you study God's Word, you get the spirit. You get the Word in your spirit, and then you're at work tomorrow. And you get to thinking, man, I'm overwhelmed. I'm, over, I'm stressed out. What do you do? You pull up a promise of God. God promises me I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be prosperous. And you just chew on that for a while. You just think about that. You run it through your mind over and over and over again. Now, in the natural, we do that. Have you ever gotten a jingle, a, a tune on your mind and couldn't get it out? You're meditating on it. Yeah, I, all last week I was, well, at least for a few days, I was whistling a tune, and I didn't even, I was unconscious. I'm going through the office. <laughs> and finally one secretary said, you know what you're whistling? I go, mm, I haven't really thought about it. Baby shark, do, 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 do. Baby shark, do, 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 do. Papa shark, do, do. Holy week, I should be singing up from the grave he arose and I'm singing songs with my grandbaby yeah th- that idea that when it goes over and over and over in your mind that's biblical meditation I know people go oh pastor I don't have time uh, to do that I mean I've got a job a nine to five I work late a lot I- I've got to put food on the table I got to take my kids to practice I got church activities I got to go to the gym and work out I get it and I don't have an easy solution. I know we live in an instant world. We want instant grits and instant broadband internet. And uh, I, I don't even like Twitter because you only get, you know, a, a few characters there. Uh, let, let me just say this. You are never wasting time. You are investing time when you meditate on God's Word. See, a mind that's filled with the Word of God leads to a heart that's full of the love of God and a life that's lived in the wisdom of God. So look it up. Let it in. 
live it out. Live it out. This is a real deal here. Live it out. Why do we, why do we let it in? Why do we ingest it? Why do we digest it? So that, verse 8, so that you may be careful to do, not to know everything written in it, to do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and then you will be successful. You know, my definition of prosperity, and a lot of people define prosperity as, oh, you know, you've got to be as rich as Bill Gates or something. And, you know, I, and I hope you are rich and, uh, you know, I hope you make a million and tithe to North Island Church. I'd be fine with that. But can I tell you, I believe that the real prosperity is this, and that is that we are obedient to the Word of God. Then these other things will follow. But we don't chase after the riches. We chase after obedience and meditate on God's Word. Let me get real personal here. If I ask how many of you believe in God's Word, how many of you really believe it's the Word of God, not, I'm, I'm guessing 98, 99% of you, most all of you, would raise your hand. But I can tell, I can tell you exactly if, how much you believe in God's Word by watching you because you tell me how much you believe by how much of it you do. How much of it you do tells me how much you believe. Like I can say, how many of you believe Jesus meant it when he said it's more blessed to give than to receive? I mean, probably 70 or 80 percent go, oh yeah, I believe that. But some of the very people raising their hand give nothing. So do you really believe that? If I said, do you believe the words of Jesus when he says, if you follow me, you're going to be a fisher of men. If you follow me, you're going to share your faith. If you follow me, you have a mission to take my good news into all the world. Do you believe that? Yes, I believe it. Are you doing it? Are you participating in that? Are you sharing your faith? So, letter B, you really only believe what you obey. That's a good thing to jot down, letter B. You really only believe what you obey. Now, I'm not trying to offend you. If I offended you and made you mad, please, an apology is in order. Come up to me after the service. Apologize, and I'll forgive you. <laughs> We've got to walk in obedience. We've got to walk in complete obedience, full obedience, not partial obedience. I talked to somebody not a terrible long ago and said, you believe the Bible? And they said, yes. I said, uh, I said to them, do you believe? They said yes. And I said, you believe in heaven? They go, oh, yeah, yeah. You believe John 3, 16? Yeah, yeah. Do you believe there's a hell? No, I don't believe that. And I said, do you know Jesus actually talked more about hell than heaven? They said, well, I don't know that I believe that. And I said to them, you know what you have? You have Dalmatian theology. Dalmatian, you know, the dogs with the spots. Some people say, well, the, the Bible is inspired in spots. And God has to inspire me to spot the right spots. No, it doesn't work that way, folks. This is not a smorgasbord. I'll oh, believe this and believe. No, we believe all God's word is inspired. Every bit of it from cover to cover. It is God's word. He says, be careful, verse 7, to obey all my law. Not part of it. You know, in the public school, they have a thing called zero tolerance. Zero tolerance means if a kid brings a knife or a gun, stick a fork in him, he's done. He will not come back to that public school system. It's over. It's almost like God is saying to Joshua, now when it comes to obeying my word, my law, I kind of have zero tolerance for you picking and choosing what part of it you want to obey. No, you obey all of my law, or if you want to be the leader, there's no time. And, you know, if you think, well, that, that, that sounds cruel. In a military academy, if you're caught cheating, any of the military academies, you're out. You'll never go back. You'll never serve in that because there's no tolerance. Listen, there's no excuse, no tolerance for us when it comes to all of God's Word. And let me just say this. If you're a guest here and you're thinking about becoming a member, let me just be real honest with you. Yeah, if you, if you get offended by scriptures and, and by constantly hearing the Bible says, um, if, if you want a church that's real politically correct and says everything that's going to meet the approval of all of our media in the world, 
Uh, North Highland Church is probably not that because North Highland Church, we're never going to water down the gospel to be politically correct. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. We're not going to try to manipulate, manipulate the word to make it more culturally relevant. No. I mean, one of the values we value, one of the highest values we have is this is God's word and it's our job to teach it and preach it just like he says it. Well, let's, let's close with this final thing. Success. What is it? It's experiencing God's presence. It's obeying God's principles. And number three, it's fulfilling the purpose of God. Experiencing the presence, obeying the principles, and fulfilling the purpose. And here it is, letter A. God guarantees. That's a, boy, you don't get many guarantees in life. God guarantees success for those who fulfill his purpose in their life. He guarantees success. You know, I, I don't know how else to say it except to say God made you and me for a purpose, and when we find that purpose, that's the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that matters. I, so yesterday, yeah, it was yesterday, somebody said to me, they said, uh, you have three services on Sunday? I said, yes. And they said, and you have to preach all three? I said, no, no. I get to preach all three because this is why God made me. This is what I, it's hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. It's the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Why? Because this is what God made me to do. And I cannot tell you how I feel when I'm preaching and I know people are receiving God's word. It, I love it. When you're doing what God wants you to do, you're going to be successful. And I love this. Uh, no one, verse 5, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. The final blank to fill in is letter B. Every foe you meet will be the foe you defeat. God's already won the victory. That's what Joshua is all, the book is about. Victory. One victory after another. You're not fighting for victory today. You're fighting from victory. Victory is your response to his ability. He's going to give you victory in your life when you get in this book.